All right, welcome back. This week on to intellectual property. This is one of the ones I think is, is one of the more interesting chapters that we cover, in part because it comes up surprisingly often in a sports context. So as a quasi-recent example, um, the fight, if you will, over who gets to use the term the 12th man. And so there was some uh, disagreement between Texas A&M University, which claimed to own the property rights to that term, uh, and the Seattle Seahawks, who also used that term. And so who started it? Um, did anybody own the term? Was there any sort of licensing that needed to occur? All of that kind of stuff. So this stuff comes up um, surprisingly often in sports. So before we talk about intellectual property, though, one of the things I want you to think about, because I'll show you the definition here on the next slide, but before we get to intellectual property, one of the things I want you to think about is the fact that we protect physical property by statute, so by law. So for example, if somebody comes and steals your lawnmower, then that's a statutory violation. They broke the law. And by doing that, they may incur some criminal penalties. So they may have to go to jail. It's a pretty extreme example, but potentially, you know, there, there would be some criminal penalties, maybe a fine or something like that associated with that. And similarly, if by them stealing your lawnmower, again, that physical property, and you, let's say, have a lawn mowing business on the side, well then by them taking your lawn mower, not only have they deprived you of some of your physical property, but they've also, um, you have incurred some opportunity costs. You could have been out mowing a few lawns and making um, 20 bucks a lawn, 30 bucks, whatever it is that you make per lawn um, in the meantime, but they denied you the opportunity to do that, so then you incurred additional damages. And so those additional damages might spark a civil lawsuit. So there's a similar idea here, which is that if somebody steals your ideas, then that might cost you money. So the whole idea behind intellectual property law is that your ideas, your mental labor, can earn you money, and so then that's something that needs to be protected. So for example, with a trademark, that is a symbol, um, oftentimes, of a company or of a service. And so um, people put a lot of time into developing those symbols, but in addition to that, um, companies, once the symbol is created, once that trademark is created, they spend a lot of time on branding, on trying to get people to have positive associations with that particular image. So if you think of something like um, the Green Bay Packers logo, you might have some positive associations with that. So you may think winning football team, title town, maybe you went to some games and had a good time there, um, those kinds of things. And so that's part of the value of the trademark as well, this concept of goodwill. So that's something then that should be protected because if anybody else can capitalize on the goodwill that you've created, on the brand recognition that you've created, well then in a way they're stealing from you. And so the idea again behind intellectual property law is to protect your ideas and that value that you've created through those ideas. So trademarks you can see there typically names or symbols. So it is some sort of um, name or icon that, like I said, represents either a company or a brand or a service most of the time. And we'll get into one other um, little iteration of that here in a minute. And then as you can see there, copyrights. So things that are protected by copyright include things like music, movies, textbooks, other books. Um, so if it is in a tangible format, so if it's written, if it's broadcast, if it's recorded, all of those things are tangible formats. And so that artistic expression then, or that expression of new ideas can be protected. So those are protected by copyright. And then the last one on there is patent law. So patents protect tangible things. So you have some sort of a new invention, whether that is a new helmet or you have perfected a new type of exercise bike or something like that. Things that you make that are physical, so new inventions, those can be patented. It doesn't entirely have to be physical things or it doesn't entirely have to be tangible things. So as an example, you can patent um, rules for gameplay. So if you invent some kind of a new card game or some kind of a new board game or something like that, um, then you can also patent those rules. So most of the time it's tangible physical things, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so patent, again, would be in that case more, um, more appropriate than copyright um, for your, your board game or whatever. All right, so as I mentioned at the outset, this stuff comes up fairly frequently in sports. So where might it come up? Well, for example, 
if you go to a Brewers game, you're going to see intellectual property all over the place. So starting with the team uniforms, so the color schemes, the logos, the um, fonts that they use, all of those things are registered trademarks by each of the teams. So the owners have a property interest in all of that merchandise for sale. It's one of the ways that those teams earn money or that professional baseball teams writ large earn money is through the sales of merchandise. And in addition to the uniforms and the logos and all of that sort of stuff, the team also owns a trademark for their mascot, for Bernie Brewer, because again, he is going to represent uh, the team, he's going to represent an experience, all of those sort of things. And they have a trademark for the famous racing sausages. So all of that stuff then is protected by trademark. And in addition to that, or as part of that, by owning and protecting that mark, then the brewers can sell all kinds of different merchandise, right? They can they can make a stool and put a brewer's logo on it. They can sell t-shirts with the famous racing sausages on them. They've got Bernie Brewer mustaches. Anything that you can think of that's related to the brewers, they can manufacture and sell and they can make money off of that. So being able to protect their logo is gonna be an important thing for them to do so that they can maintain their income. But in addition to all of those trademark issues there at the left, one of the things that the Brewers used to do, I think it's from the 2016 season, their intro music when the team would come out, they had a, a video that showed the city of Milwaukee and the players and highlights and all that kind of stuff. But the video was set to the tune of Florida's My House. And so that song is copyright protected. So the Brewers paid the artist, Florida for the rights to use that particular song. So there's copyright law as well. In addition to that, the players have an interest in controlling their name, image, and likeness because if people have positive associations with that player, then that player can market his image to um, sell certain products. So for example, you can see Ryan Braun from several years ago had a sponsorship deal with Quick Trip. Um, and then, so another, not Brewers one that, that comes to mind, but um, Aaron Rodgers and State Farm, that's a really prominent um, endorsement deal that's worth uh, the closest estimate I could find for that was about two million dollars. So at any rate the players have an interest in controlling their name image and likeness because they can profit from that and then the last one on there on the right is a baseball glove that's, a, that's what a patent form looks like and so oftentimes the equipment that the players use is patented so there's a certain um, sort of differentiator between a Rawlings glove versus a Mizuno glove versus some other company's glove. And so each of them will have patents on their different gloves to protect their particular um, design and their particular innovations that they've created. So by going to a Brewers game, you can see all three uh, aspects of intellectual property law between trademark, copyright, and patent. They're all going to be there in some form or fashion. All right, so as far as trademark law goes, Trademark law was established by the Lanham Act of 1946. And so you can see the definition there that a trademark is, quote, any word, name, symbol, or device, or any combination thereof, adopted and used by a manufacturer or merchant to identify his goods and distinguish them from those manufactured or sold by others. So an important thing about trademark is that or the concept of a trademark, is that's what's going to distinguish your brand or your service from various other brands or services. So as mentioned on the last slide, so the names, logos, and symbols associated with sports organizations are very marketable, and their primary purpose has been to create an identifiable product image through which an athletic organization can promote the sale of its product or service. Sales of merchandise with logos is a significant money generator. So for example, the most recent year I could find data on as far as college sports go, uh, in 2018, Texas led the nation, the University of Texas led the nation in merchandising revenue at $31 million. So just by putting the Longhorn on things and licensing the, the use of the Longhorn, um, the University of Texas made $31 million in the 2018 fiscal year. Um, so schools can make a ton of money on that. Now that said, a third of that, $10 million of that came from Nike. So Nike um, paid for, paid Texas to be a Nike school, just like Under Armour does with, you know, uh, Maryland, Auburn, et cetera. Similar idea. Um, and so 
that's where a lot of the money comes from is, is your particular shoe or your particular apparel deals. But behind Texas were a bunch of schools you'd expect. So uh, they're followed by Alabama, Michigan, Notre Dame, and Georgia, although specific numbers for some of those are hard to come by. So because of their profitability, organizations will go to great lengths to protect their trademarks. In, in pro sports leagues, the league, so pro sports leagues like uh, the NFL, Major League Baseball, NHL, etc., the league has the rights and controls team marks, and they usually have a, what's called a properties division of the league, which controls the licensing of league and club trademarks. So one of the interesting things in pro sports is that the merchandising revenue is typically all thrown into one big pot, and then it's divided up evenly among the team. So it's referred to as on a pro rata basis. So that pro rata distribution helps smaller market teams compete with large market clubs. So for example, the New York Yankees or the Red Sox or the Chicago Cubs, any of them might comprise 10% of all merchandise sales, but they're only entitled to 1 30th of the revenue generated from their licensing. So in a way, um, those, those merchandising deals are, are helpful for smaller market teams like the Brewers or the Rays or the Padres because basically we get a cut of um, the money that comes from the Cubs or the Red Sox or the Yankees or the Dodgers, et cetera, any of those really big market teams. So that's one of the good things that's done to offset some of those size disparities in pro sports. So um, you can see a, a less formal definition there of a trademark. So it's a symbol of a product and it protects the owners of a mark. And so as mentioned, there's lots of money in merchandising. So one of the things with that, um, so the picture there, obviously everybody's gonna recognize that particular mark. And when I show you that, or when you see that, there are probably certain thoughts that come to mind about that. So again, that could be you know winning football team, could be particular players like Aaron Rodgers, could be you know parties on Sundays or whatever, but, but hopefully there is some sort of, of positive association that you have with that particular color scheme and that particular design of a G. And so because of that, uh, because of those positive feelings, hopefully, you are more likely to uh, buy tickets to games, you're more likely to watch the games, you're more likely to um, buy their branded merchandise, all of that kind of stuff. And so um, that, that, those positive feelings then are, again, worth money to the holders of that mark, in this case, the Green Bay Packers. So where this could come up um, or could be problematic, so if I start a business and I call it Milwaukee Brewers Plumbing, so by doing that, I'm in no way affiliated with the Brewers, but what I'm trying to do is to capitalize on their reputation. I'm trying to, to confuse people a little bit and think, well, maybe the Brewers have expanded their business model. Maybe they've also gotten into plumbing in addition to being a professional baseball club. And so what I'm doing from an intellectual property standpoint is trying to capitalize on the goodwill, on the branding that the baseball club has created to try to draw business to myself. And so if it's an unrelated business like plumbing, um, that's something that the brewers would obviously tell me to stop doing, but I'm not really going to siphon off necessarily a ton of money from them. Um, but if I put out a line of clothing that is um, not a I'm trying to think of the correct word there, uh, but but put off put out um, a line of clothing that is not officially branded, but I use their particular trademark. Well, there's only a certain amount of market for professional football clothing. Like only only a certain number of people are gonna wear NFL logos on them. And among those people, they're only gonna buy a certain number of t-shirts and a certain number of sweatshirts, et cetera. And so there's a finite market for that. So if I go and make counterfeit products, that's the word I was looking for. If I go and make counterfeit products, um, I am then taking up a chunk of that limited market. And so effectively then I am taking money away from that particular team. So we covered the definition of a trademark. So one of the things to know about um, trademarks in terms of a true trademark is typically a, a symbol of a product that is generally tangible. So for example, um, so again, they're usually physical things. So examples of that would include marks like STX for a company that makes lacrosse gear, Under Armour, Nike, they, those particular trademarks represent oftentimes physical things. So they represent, you know, t-shirts, shoes, um, gloves, those kinds of things. And so that is a true trademark. So again, typical, a true trademark represents, it's a symbol representing physical things most of the time. As opposed to a service mark, 
And so a service mark is used in sale or advertising of services to identify the services of one person or one entity and distinguish those from the services of others. So for example, the NCAA little blue disc there, that's an example of a service mark because the NCAA provides a service. In their case, they provide governance of intercollegiate athletics as opposed to or separating them from another organization that does the same kind of thing, which is the NAIA, and there are others, um, but those are, are two of the biggest ones. And so that symbol represents a particular service of um, governing intercollegiate athletics. Now that said, um, something like the Green Bay G there could be considered both a true trademark, but then also a service mark in that the Packers provide a service, so they provide uh, entertainment is the service that they provide. It gives you something to do for three hours on a Sunday, but they also sell physical goods. So they sell t-shirts that have the Green Bay G on them, for example. So oftentimes companies will get uh, both trademark protection, they'll fire for, file for both. So they'll get trademark protection, but then also service mark protection because the line between the two is so thin. Oftentimes companies do a little bit of both. They provide a service and they provide some physical goods. So typically companies will, will have both of those things. Um, another example of a service mark would be something like um, a plumbing company or airlines. So the Delta Airlines um, logo, that would be a service mark because they provide transportation, um, air transportation. That's, that's what they do as a company. So theirs would be considered a service mark as much as anything. And then the last kind on there's a collective mark. And so you can see my Major League Baseball mark there all the way on the right. That's an example of a collective mark because a collective mark is a trademark or, um, yeah, we'll stick with that. It's a trademark used by members of a cooperative, association, or other collect collective group or organization that includes marks used to indicate membership in a union, an association, or other organization. So the Major League Baseball mark, if, if a team uses that particular mark, it shows that they belong to one of the 30 or 32, whatever the number is, uh, one of those t number of teams in Major League Baseball. And it differentiates them from Minor League Baseball. So if you've ever seen the Minor League Baseball mark, it's similar, it still has red, white, and blue, but it's a little bit different design on the Minor League Baseball mark. So the, those two collective marks show you that those teams belong to different levels of organization. So Major League versus Minor League Baseball. And then the Minor League Baseball mark helps differentiate the teams that are associated with Major League clubs from like independent ball. So you've got Minor League uh, Baseball that is not affiliated with any of the big league clubs. So they're not affiliated with the Brewers or the um, Rangers or any of those others. Um, and so the, the Minor League Baseball logo or collective mark identifies that this is a team that probably plays a little bit higher cali caliber of baseball because we're affiliated with a major league team as opposed to, you know, this this other team that plays out of um, some suburb and, and it's just players that couldn't make it into the minor leagues or, or what have you. All right, so you can see there the functions of a trademark. And so the things that a trademark does, so it designates the origin of a product or service which, and that's tied into the second one there where it says it denotes a standard of quality. So if I get a shirt that is an, a true, i.e. non-counterfeit, Nike shirt or Under Armour or whatever your favorite brand is, there is probably a certain level of quality that you associate with that. Um, so if you buy something that's more expensive, we tend to assume, and hopefully it's true, that those items are more durable, um, they're better fit for the purpose that you're gonna use them for. So if it's running shoes, they're really good running shoes, whatever, whatever it is that you're intending to use that for. As opposed to, again, if there's a counterfeit product, then that may not have the, the standard of quality that we would come to expect. So for example, when I was a kid, um, one of the things that, like I was really into Nike um, as a kid in the 80s and early 90s. Um, and so we couldn't afford Nike stuff at the time. Um, and so we went to a flea market, a neighbor, I was hanging out with a neighbor family and they, they took me to a flea market. And so they had all of this uh, counterfeit Nike stuff. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna buy this and nobody will notice. And so I bought a bunch of Nike stuff um, with all the cash I had at this flea market. And so I got to wear the shirts one time and then after they went through the washer, all of the print on the shirts washed off. <laughs> and they were basically blank shirts at that point. And so, you know, um, if, 
if I hadn't known going into it that those are counterfeit, like that would have been really problematic. I would have been really upset with Nike and, you know, in the days of social media, probably there would have been some social media or, um, I guess, I don't know if Yelp counts as social media, but there would be, there would have been some negative comments about that. Um, and so somebody like me who bought a product that didn't perform as we expected, um, might do some things that are damaging to their brand. So they might complain about how terrible the brand is to their friends, you know, again, either in person or on social media, they might complain on message board, whatever, um, whatever one would do uh, if they were mad about the lack of quality in a product. And so again, that could hurt Nike's business because other people will read those Yelp reviews or those Google reviews and they'll say, oh, well, I, I thought Nike made good products, but this guy says they don't. And so maybe I'll choose not to buy that. I'll buy Under Armour or Reebok instead. So being able to control that is going to be really important. So again, denotes the standard of quality. Um, it distinguishes your products or services from those of your competitors. So, it, you know, again, it separates something like Nike from Under Armour. Um, symbolizes goodwill. And again, goodwill is going to be an important concept that we'll talk about here on the next slide. Um, so the goodwill of a trademark owner and motivates customers to purchase it. So one of the ways to think about that is if you've, you know, bought a particular brand of, of running shoe, for example, and you had a really really good performance with that. They were really durable. They didn't give any blisters. They fit really well. They um, lasted longer than you expected, that kind of stuff. Then that is going to make you more likely to buy that brand again in the future. And so that's one of the components of goodwill. You had a good experience with it. And so you're more likely to return. And so that's where the motivates customers to purchase thing plays in. Um, again, companies are going to spend a significant amount of money on advertising, trying to get people to buy their product and trying to get people to return. And then one of the important things about a mark and one of the things that plaintiffs often will have to show is the that any sort of an infringing mark creates confusion in the public. So if I, you know, have, I decide I'm going to start my own footwear uh, or shoe company and apparel company and I'm going to have a mark that is a big X that's really similar to Under Armour but not exactly the same, one of the things that could come up is... I might be trying to capitalize on people's brand recognition of Under Armour, which is obviously one of the leaders in that market. And so by confusing them, I can get them to buy my product instead. And so trademark infringement, one of the big things that the plaintiffs will have to prove most of the time is that there's some sort of confusion that was created by this other, by the infringing mark. All right, so we talked about goodwill on the last slide. So again, the identification function of a tra trademark. Um, so the first one there is goodwill. So an important thing to know about a mark before I forget is that they are typically registered in 10 year increments and then you can renew them indefinitely. So once you've established a trademark, you can renew that every 10 years and you can do that for hundreds of years, however long, you know, indefinitely, right? Um, as opposed to things like copyright are gonna have finite terms as is a patent. So trademarks don't have those finite terms. They are infinitely renewable. So uh, as far as goodwill goes, so what it does is helps a purchaser recognize goods of a particular seller or manufacturer. So the trademarks are the symbols by which goodwill is advertised and buying, habit, buying habits are established. So in this sense, goodwill is a business value that arises from the reputation of a business and its relations with its customers and it's unique to a particular business. So as you can see there, one of the ways to define it is as buyer momentum or the lure to return. So again, because somebody's had a good experience with your product, they're more likely to come back or because they have positive associations with your product. So for example, um, cars that sound awesome, but I can't afford. So something like uh, Audi or BMW, et cetera. So I have, I have positive associations with those things. And so if I had the opportunity, maybe I would buy one of those cars. So that's then part of Goodwill is the brand identity that they've created um, that for those cars, for example, those are, are luxury cars. And so they act as some sort of a status symbol or, or symbolize some level of achievement. And so that's, that's the Goodwill that they've established is, is the sort of brand identity, the things that people associate with them. So Goodwill then is an intangible asset, meaning it's something that you can't touch as opposed to tangible assets, which are obviously then physical things. So one of the important things about a trademark is that it should be distinctive as opposed to descriptive. 
So a mark that is descriptive kind of tells you what it is. So for example, Raisin Bran tells you what it is. It's cereal that has bran flakes and raisins. Uh, or example, or another example would be something like Beer Nuts, tells you what it is. Holiday Inn is actually, uh, now it has acquired secondary meaning, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but Holiday Inn, again, is actually descriptive. It just tells you what it what it is. It's a, it's a hotel, if you will, that you stay at while you're on holiday or while you're on vacation. So all of those are descriptive marks. And the reason for that, or the reason why that matters, is if your mark is distinctive, meaning it doesn't just say what your product is, but it is easily identifiable with your product, and maybe only identifiable with your product, then that has much stronger trademark protection than something that is just descriptive. So for example, with Holiday Inn, as mentioned, when it started out in the 1950s, that's a descriptive mark because it just tells you what it is. Now, if somebody was infringing on the Holiday Inn trademark and Holiday Inn filed a suit over that, filed a trademark complaint over that, um, what Holiday Inn would have to show is this concept of secondary meaning. And so what that is, is association in the buyer's mind between your particular logo or your particular mark and your brand. So for example, if you tell somebody Holiday Inn that they think of your specific chain of hotels, they're not thinking of any hotel that I might stay in while I'm on holiday. So secondary meaning is that they associate um, that mark with your particular brand. So another thing is, is if you ask somebody or if you say Raisin Bran, do they think of Post Raisin Bran, which is probably one of the, the um, I guess in the brand market, <laughs> they are one of the, the more controlling interests. Do they think of that or do they think of a generic? And so um, again, it's harder to protect those uh, trademarks that are, are simply descriptive. So you then have to show secondary meaning. And I'll give you another example of those here in a minute. In terms of being distinctive, so there are three things or three types of distinctive marks. And the first one on there is an arbitrary mark. So if a mark is arbitrary, then there is no connection. So you, you may have um, two objects that are well known, but there's not a connection between those two inherently. So as an example, Apple computers would be an arbitrary mark. So everybody knows what an Apple is, everybody knows what a computer is, but prior to that particular computer company, there was no association between those two items. And so linking those two is completely arbitrary. An Apple has nothing to do with a computer outside of that particular company. And then that particular company is symbolized by the, you know, the white Apple, right? So that's an arbitrary connection or an arbitrary mark, one that there, you make a connection that otherwise wouldn't exist. There's no reason for that to exist. As opposed to a fanciful mark, which is something that is newly invented. So it's something that didn't exist prior to your company. So for example, a, a fanciful mark would be something like Google. That was not a word that existed prior to the creation of that company. And so fanciful marks, have the strongest trademark protection in terms of um, the owners of those marks are the most likely to be successful in their suits for infringement because that word or that that word or symbol is not doesn't exist outside of the company and so if somebody infringes on it it wasn't just by chance it was probably a pretty deliberate decision trying to create confusion amongst consumers and then the last one on there is suggestive so suggestive mark is one that requires some imagination on the part of the user that they have to make a connection between the mark and what that product does. So an example would be Gleam Toothpaste. So in Gleam Toothpaste, the suggestion is that by using that toothpaste, it is going to make your teeth gleam, right? It's gonna make them nice and white and shiny. And so that uh, is gonna be that imagination on the part of the user. It's going to, the, the consumer is gonna to have to make that connection. All right, so we talked about secondary meaning. Um, and just to make sure I gave you the actual definition of secondary meaning, because I don't think I did, the actual definition is mental recognition in a buyer's mind associating words, colors, and designs with goods from a single source. So when they see your mark, they only think of one brand. They don't think of everybody that, that uh, does that particular thing. So if you think, if somebody thinks ping pong, if you're in, in if 
you're in the business where you make ping pong tables. Um, if you had a trademark, or if you tried to trademark ping pong, you'd have to show that, that consumers associated that name with your particular brand of equipment as opposed to just the game more broadly. So you can see there, secondary, recognition, uh, secondary meaning, recognition in the buyer's mind, um, and we talked about all of that stuff. So, and here are some, some marks. So, Rogue there. Um, so, you, if you're familiar with that company, then you probably associate that particular color scheme, the black and white, and that particular font with a certain type of uh, resistance training equipment. As opposed to another black and white scheme, CCM, um, if you're familiar with hockey, you probably associate that with hockey equipment. And then the last one on there, Louisville Slugger, so uh, primarily baseball equipment. So in terms of those things, before I move on, um, so for example, so Rogue would, would fall under the category of being arbitrary. So there's nothing that would connect Rogue necessarily with resistance training. Um, so that would be an arbitrary mark. They made a connection that doesn't necessarily exist. Now you can kind of stretch it and say it's suggestive, but realistically it's probably more um, arbitrary. As opposed to CCM, that is, I think that would be probably fanciful. It does, there is a, it's an acronym. It's like Canadian Cycle and Motor Works or something like that. Um, they were not primarily in the hockey business, but they are now. Um, I think they originally started out with bicycles or something to that effect. But anyway, you could classify that one as fanciful. And then Louisville Slugger would probably fall under the category of being suggestive because if you use their product, then you can hit the baseball really far. And so the buyer then has to make some association in their mind between those concepts. All right, so with trademark infringement then, somebody is basically trying to capitalize on the goodwill that you've created. If you are a trademark owner, um, they're trying to make money at your expense. So. Um, to that point, unauthorized use of a mark is injurious, costs you money, um, because as I mentioned, demand for a product or service is finite. So if, if you've got, you know, there's only a certain market for uh, weight training equipment, there's only a certain market for uh, plumbing services, those kinds of things. And so if somebody infringes on your mark, well then they're, they are taking away from the market that you would otherwise have access to. So. If you are suing somebody or if you are filing a complaint for trademark infringement, the first thing that you're going to have to do as the trademark owner is establish that you have a protectable property right. You have to establish that you have a trademark. Um, and if your mark is not arbitrary, fanciful, or suggestive, then you're going to have to show secondary meaning. So if you have a descriptive mark, you're going to have to show that concept of secondary meaning, that when people see that mark, they associate that with your particular brand. And then the second thing you're going to have to show is that the infringing mark, the similar mark, is likely to cause confusion in the mind of a consumer. So there's a number of different ways that you can do that. Um, one is through direct evidence. So um, a classic example comes from the late 1990s. So Pinehurst is an internationally famous golf course in North Carolina. But the name Pinehurst refers to the, ge the geographic region that the golf course is in more broadly. And so because the name refers to a particular geographic region, another company came in and, and established golf courses or built golf courses and then also used the name Pinehurst. Um, and so they were, they were, you know, Pinehurst with something else after it. Um, but the idea of that company, the, the developer that came in later, was to capitalize on that brand recognition, on that goodwill that the internationally famous golf course had created. And so the internationally famous course sued the uh, developers to, to get them to stop using the name Pinehurst because they were taking away from the famous course, but then also creating confusion in the mind of the consumer. And so the way that the original Pinehurst was able to demonstrate that was the fact that they got phone calls intended for the other Pinehurst resorts and the other Pinehurst courses, and likewise the other way, and then each got the other party's mail. So nobody knew which one was the actual or 
a lot of people didn't understand which one was the actual Pinehurst course as opposed to the new, the infringers coming in and trying to capitalize on that goodwill and, and that brand recognition. And so ultimately the court enjoined the new courses, the, the developer from using the name because, so Pinehurst, using the previous example, Pinehurst would fall under the example of being descriptive because it's just describing the particular region in which that course was found. And so what, what the owners of, of the famous course had to do was to show that when people thought Pinehurst, they thought this particular course that they'd seen on TV, they'd seen in PGA tournaments and all of those things, that's that aspect of uh, secondary meaning. And then again, that there was confusion created because you get this mixing up of phone calls, you get this mixing up of mail, and so ultimately the original course was able to uh, stop the infringers from using the name Pinehurst. The NHL clothing example um, is a kind of an entertaining one. Uh, it's a good idea. There was a, a clothing manufacturer based out of Dallas in the 1970s, and so what they did was they produced a line of clothing using all of the NHL trademarks. So the, the league, obviously, at that time wasn't as big as it is now. There weren't near as many teams. But of the teams that existed then, they used all their trademarks. So, you know, the Blackhawks, the Rangers, the Bruins, etc., And um, put them on all kinds of t-shirts and sweatshirts and, and anything you can think of in terms of clothing, and then sold it. But what they did to try to cover themselves, because they were obviously infringing on a trademark, was they, on the tag on the inside of the clothing, wrote, not officially licensed. And so they, the company argued that there wasn't any confusion created because when you, if you looked at the, the shirt closely, you could understand or you realized that it wasn't something that the Blackhawks or whichever NHL team had authorized. Um, and so, of course, the court didn't buy that argument and, and understood that what they were trying to do was to use those logos without paying any sort of licensing fees. And again, to capitalize on the goodwill that those particular brands had built up. And so same kind of thing there. The court enjoined them, kept them from using those marks. All right. So once you have a trademark, then there's, there are several ways to lose control of the mark. And so the first one there is abandonment. So if you stop using a mark for three consecutive years, then you lose control of that mark. So if it is your mark, you have to have it not quite continuously in use, but pretty close to it. So again, if you stop using it for three consecutive years, then basically it's up for grabs. Um, this one came up in the case or in the realm of pro sports in 1984. It's come up since, but one of the more famous cases where abandonment came up was in 1984 where the NFL's uh, Baltimore Colts packed up in the middle of the night, if you're familiar with the story, uh, and, and moved to Indianapolis. And so after the Baltimore Colts moved to Indianapolis and became the current Indianapolis Colts, there was a Canadian Football League team, or CFL team, that decided to rename themselves the Baltimore CFL Colts. And so uh, what they were obviously trying to do was to create some level of confusion because the, the Baltimore Colts had moved. And so maybe if you didn't closely follow the NFL, you didn't really know where they went. So you might think that they were ended up in Canada somewhere. Um, and so what ended up happening there was that the, uh, the, the CFL team, where this applies to what we're talking about right now, they argued for abandonment. They said, well, the Colts have moved to Indianapolis and so they're no longer the Baltimore Colts. And so they've ab abandoned the Baltimore Colts name so therefore it's up for grabs and so the court said while that may be true you are trying to create confusion because the team still exists it just exists somewhere else they're not the baltimore colts so it's still the same franchise they're just the Annap indianapolis colts instead of the baltimore colts and so as a result you're trying to create confusion you're trying to capitalize on that still existing franchise's brand name even though they've changed their city and so the court kept the cfl team from using from being the baltimore cfl colts um, the other one on there is licensing, licensing to others without control. And so what effectively that means is that if you just let anybody make products with your logo on them, and they may be really good high quality products, or they may be really shoddy, like my flea market t-shirts where the first time you wash them, all of the logos wear off, um, and you just don't care. All you're doing is, is licensing your, your stuff and just letting any, anybody use it. Um, if you don't control the quality of that, or you don't control how it's used, then that's another way to lose control of your mark. Because they're with that, so remember that part of goodwill 
is that the consumer associates certain things with your product. And so if they associate high quality with your product and you license it to anybody, including shoddy manufacturers, well then that sort of throws off what your goodwill is. It throws off what your brand is. And so then um, that's something that the court would consider. And then the last one on there is failure to police the marks, marks misuse. Um, so this one comes up usually in terms of negative publicity. Um, so if somebody else is infringing on your mark, if they are either trying to create confusion or they are trying to capitalize on the goodwill that you've created, you have to send them a cease and desist letter. You have to get them to stop doing that. And if they don't, then you have to initiate a lawsuit because if you don't control uh, the use of your mark, well then you lose control of your mark. And so one of the things that uh, I thought was interesting when I came to Whitewater is the fact that the Warhawk is, is everywhere, which is cool. Actually, I really like that. Um, so the Warhawk is not only used by varsity athletic teams, but it's also used by rec sports teams. And it's used, you know, you see it on the academic side of the house and all of that sort of thing, um, which is very different from what I was used to uh, as an undergrad and doctoral student at the University of Texas, where they are super litigious. Um, they are very, very protective of the Longhorn silhouette, which is part of the reason that they um, made the most money on, on merchandising the Longhorn stuff. Um, so for example, if you're on a club sports team at the University of Texas, you can't use the official Longhorn logo. So, you know, like uh, club sports here at Whitewater, so like lacrosse, um, club volleyball, those teams, they can all use the Warhawk logo. But when I was an undergrad at Texas and, I, and was on the powerlifting team, this was our logo. So it's cool. I really, I've always liked that logo. So you can see a, a longhorn with weights on his, on his long horns. Um, that's the symbol for the club, club team because only the athletic department is allowed to use the longhorn. Now, there are some, some exceptions. You can get permission of a dean. You can get permission of an academic department um, to use the Longhorn, but it's, it's really rare. Effectively, what happens at Texas is that anybody not affiliated with the actual athletic department, so anybody that's not one of the varsity athletic teams, um, either creates their own Longhorn logo, kind of like this one, or they use some version of the seal, which is um, a shield that has like a book and a lamp and all the other stuff in it. That's what the academic side of the house uses. So anything academics uses a shield, anything athletics uses a longhorn, and then anybody else, basically you're free to create your own. So there's a different iteration on the longhorn rugby one versus longhorn lacrosse. Both of those are club sports. Um, so anyway, part of the reason that they do that is because again, they, um, they wanna maintain really strict control of their mark because they don't wanna be accused of not policing the mark's misuse. If they just let any club use it for any purpose, then from the standpoint of the athletic department, they feel like that's weakening the association between the Longhorn silhouette and um, one particular brand of athletics. All right, so there are some circumstances where um, trademark infringement is not necessarily okay, um, but there are times when you can use marks or things that are very similar to a registered mark. So for example, if, if you are making fun of a mark, so if you're using a trademark to make fun of it, to poke fun at what they do, then that oftentimes is allowed in terms of trademark infringement. So an example comes there in the lower right um, from a lawsuit in the mid 1990s. So you can see the legitimate product there, the, the tops baseball cards, um, and then that particular player, Will Clark, the first baseman for the Giants. And then you can see a line of cards there in the lower right that's making fun of them. And they're not exactly using the marks specifically, but they are using a similar color scheme. And so tops and Major League Baseball complained of trademark infringement on the part of this um, parody baseball card company. And so the court found that those cards didn't create confusion, right? Because you wouldn't, you wouldn't purchase those thinking those were legitimate baseball cards and that they were intended to amuse the consumers who purchased them. And so because of that, the fact that they used similar color schemes and uniform appearances to the actual cards didn't create confusion and therefore was not trademark infringement. So if you're using a mark to make fun of it, under certain circumstances, that is often acceptable. 
Um, and then dilution, you can see that um, loose definition there. So dilution is the lessening of the capacity of a famous mark to identify or distinguish the goods or services of either, uh, or sorry, regardless of either the presence or absence of competition between the parties or a likelihood of confusion, mistake, or deception. So what you're doing in the case of dilution is you are loosening the link between the actual mark and their goods or services. So there's a couple different ways to do that. One of the ways is through blurring, which means that you take a modified or essentially really similar looking mark and you use that as your own. Um, and so we'll talk about a case of blurring here in a second. So again, generally blurring is a modified mark or essentially one that is uh, really, really similar. And then tarnishment is that you use the mark in an unwholesome or shoddy way. Um, so an example of that, comes from the NBA, trying to get to click forward a little bit. See if we can get that done. There we go. Comes from 1999 in the NBA. There was a record label, and the particular label is called Entertainment. In 1999, they released an album titled SDE, which stood for Sports, Drugs, and Entertainment. And in the promotional materials, the company made a banner that included the NBA logo that was altered slightly. So rather than having the basketball as the actual NBA logo does, the player was holding a gun. And so the NBA sued and they alleged tarnishment. And so obviously if you're gonna modify the NBA logo and associate it with gun violence, then that's something that could harm the NBA's brand. And so realistically what they sued for was not only tarnishment, because you're hurting their brand, but also blurring because they took the original mark and they modified it. So related to that, because um, as I mentioned earlier, the University of Texas is one of the most litigious universities I can think of. Um, so there's the classic Longhorn silhouette there on the left with the burnt orange and white color scheme. So again, one that we most people would associate with one particular college football team uh, in brand. And then you can see a, a logo there on the right that looks really similar, um, except that the horns are sawed off and then you can see the little saw them off there. So that was made by a company in College Station, Texas. So College Station is home to Texas A&M University, which until conference realignment was the Longhorns mm -hmm. biggest rival. Excuse me, phone call. One second, be back. Sorry about that. So anyway, before conference realignment, uh, the Longhorn's primary rival was Texas A&M and College Station. And so one of the things in Texas A&M's fight song, they call it the War Hymn, is a verse that includes the refrain, quote, saw varsity's horns off, end quote. Uh, and so they sing that if you ever watch an A&M game where they're swaying in the stands, that's part of the chant is saw varsity's horns off, varsity of course being the Longhorns. And so since that's part of their song, they also made t-shirts that said saw them off. And most of the t-shirts included a Bible verse that said, I think it's from Proverbs, something about um, sawing off the horns of the wicked and uphold, or, well, they left it off at saw, sawing off the horns of the wicked. And then if you continue reading that proverb, the verse uh, goes on to say, lifting up the horns of the righteous, but they left that part off the shirts. So anyway, so in the mid 2000s, um, the University of Texas sent a cease and desist letter to the t-shirt company in College Station that produced those shirts. The company did not. And so in 2007, UT filed suit alleging trademark infringement. So um, basically what Texas said was that, going back a slide, if we can, maybe go forward and go back. There we go. So basically what Texas said was that this was a case of dilution, that the modified mark, and so you know dilution by blurring, that the t-shirt company was using a modified mark of the Longhorn where they simply removed the horns, but that this would could lead to some confu consumer confusion because the mark is so similar to the actual Longhorn silhouette that it might lead to some confusion. And further, that it was tarnishment, it was using their mark in an unwholesome or shoddy way because of course it was associating their mark with evil um, using the snippet of the Proverbs verse that they did. And so UT sued them to get them to stop using the logo. And so ultimately um, the case was settled and the t-shirt company agreed to use a modified version of the Longhorn mark that looks like this. So they added a little tuft of white fur and two little white nostrils and then they trademarked that separately. Um, and so 
you can see um, that modified mark there. And so with that, Texas was satisfied. Uh, the company ended up paying $200,000 in legal fees and then $25,000 in damages to the University of Texas and then agreed to stop using the logo. So, um, and interestingly, as a side note, they the t-shirt sales dropped off quite a bit because who wants one that looks like that? That's not even really close to the Longhorn. And so shortly thereafter, I think they stopped producing them because that's so cartoonishly different from the actual Longhorn. Um, so another thing to know is that in addition to their logos, universities can protect their color scheme. So for example, for Texas, the burnt orange and white, um, if they can demonstrate that those color schemes have acquired secondary meaning. So if you can show a burnt orange and white and people, um, if Texas could demonstrate, hey, every time people see those two colors together, they think the University of Texas, then that's something that can also receive trademark protection. Typically, if they just use one color or two colors, it's not going to be something that gets trademark protection. But if there's a particular color scheme in a pattern, so for example, North Carolina, um, if they use Carolina blue plus navy and then white in an argyle pattern, which is characteristic of the University of North Carolina, that's something that could receive trademark protection. So while Texas has trademarked the color burnt orange, um, it, they would they would be hard pressed if somebody just sued or if somebody just used that color, they'd be hard pressed um, to show confusion with that if somebody was just using the color. So usually there's going to have to be some some more there. Um, what else? So as far as Texas being litigious, um, they got a lot of bad press, and this was from about five years, six years ago, something like that. So what you see there is is the Longhorn logo on a maroon helmet. Um, and that's a school in Mississippi that was called the Longhorns. And so Texas sent them a cease and desist letter. And so the school stopped using that logo. Um, and so, like I said, they got a lot of bad press for that because it kind of looks like this big time university is pushing around uh, this little high school in the middle of nowhere, Mississippi, um, which to some extent is true, right? But Part of that is Texas is trying to police the mark's misuse. And that, like I said, they are very aggressive about that. And so um, in doing that, they're making sure that they don't lose control of the mark. Um, and similarly, they've, they've trademarked the name Texas. They've trademarked the tower. We talked about that on the first day of class. I showed you the example where a guy was going to use a replica of the tower as part of his car wash. And so Texas uh, sued him. Um, and back when I was... In high school, I worked for a candle factory, one of the cooler jobs that I had, making candles. Uh, and so one of the things that we did was, because we were in Georgetown, which is the town I grew up in, which is about 25 minutes north of downtown Austin. Um, and so the candles that we made amongst them was a replica of the Longhorn Tower, and then we made it in burnt orange. And so our little candle factory also got a cease and desist letter from the University of Texas while I was there. So we had to stop producing those as well. So again, um, while schools do, uh, or you know, businesses or, or professional teams do sometimes get some bad press about the cease and desist letters or the threats of lawsuits that they send out, they do it for a reason. And the reason is to maintain control of their mark because if they don't, then they can lose it and that will cost them a significant amount of money. Remember at the outset I said that Texas made $31 million in, 21, or in 2018 off of merchandising alone. So if you lose control of that mark, that's going to cost you a lot of money. So that's why they do that. All right. So and on that note, because I know how Texas is, it surprised me when we moved up here that Bucky was everywhere. So, you know, there's obviously normal Bucky. And then Bucky, a modified version of Bucky, is on the Badger coaches. And then he's on popcorn and he's in all kinds of other places. And so I was surprised that um, Wisconsin licensed Bucky to be on as many things as he is, but he's kind of all over the place. So it's, it's just a very different philosophical approach. And I think part of it is because there's only, you know, it's the University of Wisconsin and it kind of represents the entire state. Of course, there's a whole, there's the UW system and then there's Marquette and there's some other schools. But on some level, UW-Madison is kind of the university that represents the state, as opposed to in a lot of other states, you know, so like Texas, you've got Texas, A&M, um, Tech, Rice, Baylor, etc. So there's not just kind of that one institution that represents the entire state, and so Wisconsin's a little bit different uh, in that, and I think, I would guess, and I don't know this, this is speculative on my part, but I would guess that um, the Golden Gopher in Minnesota is probably pretty similar, that, that he probably, the Goldie, shows up in a number of places that um, for example, the Longhorn Mark wouldn't. All right, 
So if you have a successful brand, then one of the things that you're gonna have or be able to do is to license the use of your mark. And so you can make profit off of uh, the fees that people pay you to put your mark on crock pots or hammers or, or chairs or sweatshirts or anything else. Um, and you can even, in the case of Aaron Rodgers, you can see my little registered trademark there, Aaron Rodgers has trademarked his name. And so he did that in an attempt to create some extra security in terms of controlling his name, image, and likeness, which, as mentioned earlier, is very profitable. So, for example, his, his uh, State Farm deal is worth about $2, $2 million. So I couldn't find an exact number on that, but it's somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, so on top of his actual salary from playing football, he earns a significant amount on the side from endorsements. And we talked earlier in the class about um, – athletes like LeBron James that actually the majority of the money that they make comes from their endorsements. So being able to control their name, image, and likeness is going to be really, really important for them as well. So here's a case of trademark infringement that you might be aware of. It's a few years old at this point. Um, but so you can see the Milwaukee Bucks logo there. So um, that logo they started using or they unveiled in April of 2015. And then in December of 2016, so uh, a little more than a year and a half later, Jägermeister, which makes a gross black licorice flavored liqueur, um, the Jägermeister company filed a formal opposition with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office over the Buck's new logo. And so Jäger claimed that the new logo, the one there on the left for the Bucks, created a likelihood of confusion that it was dilution by blurring. They effectively were arguing that the Bucks had taken their logo and just changed it a little bit. And that it was dilution by tarnishment and created a false suggestion of association between the entities which might bring Jaeger into contempt or disrepute and it was deceptiveness on the part of the Bucks. Basically, what Jaeger was contending was that the poor play of the Bucks could reflect poorly on their brand and affect their business. Um, at least that's what the dilution by tarnishment argument is. Um, so, and they also are, were arguing that the Bucks were trying to create a sense of confusion in the mind of consumers and falsely associate themselves with the Jägermeister brand, which is interesting because I, I actually didn't know what the Jäger thing looked like all that much until, until this suit. Um, but then in going back and looking at it, I was like, oh, okay, those two are similar. Um, but so Jaeger has been using that, that logo since 1968. The, an interesting facet of this is that what Jaeger filed was just an opposition. So that wouldn't actually stop the Bucks from using the logo. Uh, in order to do that, they'd have to file a federal lawsuit seeking an injunction, but they didn't. And so the speculation was, since Jaeger only filed an opposition, what they were probably trying to do is to seek concessions like cash settlements or maybe that Jaeger wanted some leverage in being able to provide alcohol or have their own bars or, or something like that, getting some distribution in the new Pfizer forum. So that might have been what was going on there. In any case, there was a settlement and the terms of it weren't disclosed. Um, so ultimately, that, that case was settled between those two parties. I don't think if that case had gone to court that Jaeger would have been successful. I mean, they're, they're similar looking marks, but they're in, they're in different but overlapping industries. You know, so they've got professional basketball and then you've got liqueur sales. And, and so, you know, those two are peripherally related in that at professional basketball games, they do sell alcohol. Um, but I don't think anybody, I don't think that Jaeger would be able to show that people would see the Bucks logo and go, oh yeah, that German liqueur. I don't think that they would be able to establish consumer confusion in that case. So, and, and I guess, my assumption is that the Bucks just decided it wasn't worth their time and whatever Jaeger wanted wasn't enough that they were willing to um, fight it too hard. And so they, they settled that opposition. So another relatively recent issue involves uh, one of the newest NHL teams, the Golden Knights, and then the U.S. Military Academy, Army. So in January of 2018, similar to what happened in the, uh, with Jaeger, uh, the U.S. Army filed opposition to the marks of the Las Vegas Knights. So you can see um, one of the official marks of Army there in the lower left, another one there in the middle, and then you can see the color scheme that their football team uses there in the lower right. So the official moniker of the Army sports teams has been the Black Knights since 1999. They've been called the Black Knights of the Hudson because of their black uniforms since at least the early 1950s. In its filing, the Army says the NHL team, quote, has chosen and used similar black and gold 
and yellow and white color schemes on their uniforms, marketing, advertisements, and its hockey arena, mimicking Army's colors and further adding to the likelihood of confusion in the public. End quote. So Army is saying that the Golden Knights, whose logos and uniforms look like this, were intentionally trying to create confusion, that they were trying to associate themselves with the army, and so by doing that, trying to capitalize on the goodwill of the army and hopefully be able to sell more tickets. That's effectively what Army is arguing here. Army says that it's used the Golden Knights uh, name since 1969 in connection with its parachute team and with recruiting, and that it owned, quote, common law rights in color scheme to black and gold and yellow and white, end quote. So the NHL team, the Vegas Knights, unveiled their logo in 2016, an Army expressed opposition 10 months later and filed a formal opposition with the Patent and Trademark Office in January of 2018. The Knights, the Vegas Knights, uh, owner, he's a, a guy by the name of Bill Foley, and he graduated from the Military Academy at West Point in 1967 and was said to be strongly considering naming the new NHL team the Black Knights, which obviously is Army's nickname. So um, despite choosing a different name, the inspiration for the Knights was not a secret. So in its filing, Army points to an article in the Washington Post in June of 2018, um, in which the team's general manager, George McPhee, makes that connection explicit. Quote, and this is McPhee being quoted here, quote, Bill Foley is a West Point guy, sort of using those colors. You know his history at West Point. You know about the classmates he lost serving the country, so those colors mean a lot to us, end quote. The notice of opposition from the Army also cites a tweet from TSN that quotes uh, McPhee, again, the GM of the Knights, saying, quote, We were going to be the Black Knights, but we already had the Blackhawks in the league, so the league was trying to get us to come up with another name, so another name used at West Point is the Golden Knights for the parachute team, end quote. So the team responded to the opposition that the confusion between the parachute team and an NHL franchise is unlikely. Um... So Army doesn't have any trademarks for Golden Knights. Two colleges do, though, the University of Central Florida and the College of St. Rose, which is in upstate New York. Um, and initially, actually, um, the NHL team had their trademarks rejected by the Patent and Trademark Office for their similarity to the College of St. Rose, which, because I had some time this week, I looked up what their logos look like and are not similar, in my opinion, at all to what Vegas is using. But nonetheless, initially... The Vegas Golden Knights logos were rejected because they looked too much like the College of St. Rose. So ultimately, in this case, um, the Army settled this one as well. Uh, and similarly, the terms were undisclosed, but they settled it about six months after they filed the opposition. So, and then there's one more relatively recent issue, and this one comes from March of 2018. So it's a little bit more dated now. Um, but if you're not aware of, of, this, um, of this game... So at the 2018 men's NCAA tournament, the University of Maryland at Baltimore County, and so you can see their logo there, became the first number 16 seed ever to beat a number one seed when they defeated Virginia. So prior to that, number one seeds were 135-0 and 0 in the history of the tournament. So while UMBC's actual logo, which again you can see on the right there, and you can see the little TM, while that particular logo is trademarked, the actual name was not at the time of their win. So the Retrievers, they had UMBC had tried to trademark that, but it was considered too generic, and so it didn't get protected. And so right after they won, Baltimore County trademarked 16 over 1, UMBC Retrievers, and Retriever Nation. So basically what ended up happening is after the win, they were scrambling, trying to trademark everything they could think of so they could capitalize on it because um, the report was that the, the win was worth more than $50 million in advertising impact for the school. And then the university and its bookstore reported a huge surge in the number of online uh, sales after that win. People bought lots and lots of UMBC stuff after they beat Virginia that year. So um, again, your mark is worth or can be worth quite a bit to you. All right, so what I'm going to do is cut this off here, um, and then we'll pick up with the other two components of trademark law when uh, in, in a separate video.